Greetings, future fossils, and welcome to episode 174 of the podcast that explores our place in time. Once upon a time, in January of 2016, my friend Evan Snyder and I recorded the first episodes of Future Fossils. And here we are now, five and a half years later, and his life and mine both look very different now than they once did, but the nerd at the core of each of us lives on. Both of us continue to produce and publish independent music. Evan's work under the moniker Skytree is some of the most lush, textural, interesting electronic music with which I shape air on a regular basis. Those of you who have listened to Future Fossils for a while are already familiar with his work as the music of Skytree constitutes most of the sonic brand of Future Fossils to date, along with my own electronic guitar improvisations. But these days, Evan also works as a robotics engineer for Amazon in Boulder, Colorado. And it is for this reason that I invited him back on the show to have a conversation with me about the new auditory environments that we are creating and the evolutionary and psychological influences to the design of those environments when we are in fact lucky enough to design them and not merely be subjected to them. I think one key takeaway from this conversation, for me anyway, has been that even as we wield tools that our ancestors may have considered godlike in their potency, we are nonetheless constrained in both desire and in ergonomics to create worlds that suit a radically undesigned human temperament, and that even if one day we manage to transcend our specific biological instantiation, we will ultimately nonetheless and forever serve the deep physical underlying realities of whatever incarnation we inhabit. I've been reading Chris Ryan's book Civilized to Death in preparation for having him on the show as well as for the Future Fossils book club, wink wink, and one of the things I admire about his particular breed of futurism is how he articulates it in the question, what kind of zoo do we wish to create for ourselves? Ryan locates the eroded island of human exceptionalism in the claim that humans are perhaps the only species that has domesticated itself. And as such, it should come as no surprise that whatever comes after the modern era will, in important ways, sound like that which came before. I suggest checking the show notes to this episode for a list of related conversations, including one with biomusic scholar Patricia Gray, and my now ancient conversation with Sarah Huntley about raising robots right. Oh, and of course, also Dr. Rupert Till's episode on acoustic archaeology. If you're interested in going deeper into the inquiry that lives at the crossroads of deep time and sound design. Also, if you are a Patreon supporter, then you will soon be privy to the second half of this conversation with Evan, in which he and I discuss his work to reconstruct the auditory environment of the age of dinosaurs as well as his use of control voltage and modular synthesis to turn radioactive mineral samples, including dinosaur bones, and also creek water and plants into electronic music. Normally, I prefer to just release these conversations in one big chunk and save the private feed for something else. I personally kind of find it annoying when people save the back half of a conversation for paid subscribers. But hey, realistically, with a two-year-old and an infant in the house, 
I really just could not find the time to edit this episode in full before getting it out. I mean, I want to thank everybody who has subscribed to this show and endured my utterly unreliable release schedule. I'm doing everything in my power now to get back to producing more episodes on a regular basis in addition to all the things that are going on backstage at Patreon, which, by the way, gives me the occasion for gratitude to the following new supporters. Douglas Duff, Kinthea Burnett, Nick Travaglini, Andrew Bramble, Sam Barton, Wesley Ryan Pinkham, Logan Mace, and the AGI Laboratory admin, Taryn Rosenthal, and Michael Morgenstern, all of whom recently became paid supporters or upped their pledges. Thank you and thank everyone else who has been helping me keep this show alight. We have managed to roll this entirely on listener support for the last five and a half years. If you believe in the value of these conversations, both those on the public feed and others that ripple out from it, then please consider chipping in a few bucks a month, helping yourself to the green room buffet table I've laid out for Patreon supporters, and helping me find that much more time to continue exploring otherwise unfundable conversations at the edges of the known and the knowable. And be sure to subscribe, because over the next few weeks, I will be sharing some of the most interesting conversations I've ever had for Future Fossils, including a chat with University of Utah philosopher T. Nguyen, and three extraordinary panel discussions, one for this year's Psilocybin Summit, and two for the Complexity Weekend Hackathon, where you really get to see this show in multi-ball mode, and it is awesome. And, okay... <laughs> Enough about that. Thank you for listening and enjoy this conversation with my great friend, Evan Snyder. Okay, cool. Evan, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show that you co-founded. <laughs> yeah, great to be back. Um, it's been a long time, um, and you've done just fine in my absence, if not excelled. So uh, I don't necessarily feel like that hampered you in any way. I, I do, uh, from time to time, listen in and uh, really enjoy your ongoing conversations with new guests and just really happy to be back and have the opportunity to speak with you again on this podcast that we both started up together. So it's been a long time. It has. And in the meantime, uh, you and I and everyone else has mutated considerably. So I think it's worth just establishing for folks a little bit about who you, who you were and then how, who you are now, because both of us went uh, <laughs> corporate, I guess, or something like that. You know, like, I mean, I work for an ostensibly maverick independent place, but we are beholden like everyone else to the market and, and the, the downward causal flows of the state. And then you're in the real den of technocracy there. And it's an interesting place for someone who I know through the visionary festival scene and, uh, you know, someone who's spends a lot of time talking about crystals and stuff like that to be. So, yeah. yeah, I guess, what am I saying? I'm saying for those who haven't heard your many pr previous episodes of Future Fossils, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are both on and off the clock, because both of those bear on this conversation. Sure. So first of all, out of the two of us, I'd wager I've gone a lot more corporate. So <laughs> just <laughs> full disclosure, I feel like that's a... a lopsided equation. But it's interesting looking back on when we started this podcast, I felt like I would have something to contribute to the conversation. And, you know, of course, as we get older and look back on things, we realize how little we know, and that tends to just progress over time. So 
if for any reason I was qualified to <laughs> share my thoughts on a podcast uh, those many years ago when this was first started, I hopefully am more qualified now. I, I can't say for sure because, again, I just know more and more about what I don't know as time goes on. But life has changed a lot. Um, I've leveled up my personal endeavors quite a bit since we last spoke on the podcast. And indeed, after, you know, we... Um, had our first couple of conversations on here, uh, went back to school for mechanical engineering, specializing, specializing in industrial design. And uh, part of my intention there was to uh, sort of create a parallel income stream and development sort of pipeline for myself as a person and hopefully my contributions to the world where I could so that I could focus on music and the things I love to do without the need or concern for really Financial, financially incentivizing them from making them my main bread and butter. My music is typically rather esoteric, and I don't necessarily squeeze it into the boxes that maybe I should if I wanted to be more profitable. And uh, when faced with those two options, uh, you know, continue to focus on music as a, a full-time producer and live musician, which I have been doing for five or six years, you know, when we first met um, leading up to the podcast on its first episodes. So I wanted to make sure I could keep doing that into perpetuity without necessarily being concerned about um, trying to either keep touring constantly, tailoring my music to the live environment. Um, and, and side note, no uh, shade whatsoever to other musicians that choose to do that. I find it really fascinating and a noble endeavor um, for many artists, and it's just not that easy. It's, in fact, very hard. Um, so I figured if I'm already used to living a very difficult lifestyle financially and otherwise, why not go back to school, see if I had some chops in engineering, and uh, thankfully some key players uh, believe that I did, and uh, I was brought on to a startup here in Boulder back in, I think, 2018, and uh, we were pretty much immediately, within about a couple of months of me starting with the, the startup company acquired by Amazon, and uh, we had a focus in autonomous mobile robots, or what are called AMRs had a fascination with robotics since I was a child. It's it's one of many applications in engineering that I feel very intrigued by and would be happy to contribute to. So um, I somehow found myself now in the field of autonomous mobility working for Amazon's Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Division, um, which is a uh, R&D um, group within Amazon that focuses on building out new technologies. So I know that comes with a lot of resistance and some misunderstandings as well as some fair criticisms. Uh, I just happen to find myself in this. I don't plan on doing it forever, but for right now it's fascinating and uh, a key element of it is safety. So um, as long as we can give people safer working environments, I feel like there is a positive to the technology that we're applying and it's still in its infancy as well. So we have yet to see how far or where it's going to go. That's the, the long answer to your question, I suppose, but there's a lot more to it. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I suspect once we prime the pump on this conversation, then it won't feel so rote. You and I can can riff on each other. But so like, I want to I just want to put this in place as why this is subject why this conversation now for future fossils. And I think, you know, one of the things that's happened in this show, uh, in your absence, is that it has uh, grown into kind of a commentary on the way that our technological environments have created a new wilderness. You know, the modern project of control has undermined itself by leading to the innovation of systems that we don't understand and or systems with consequences that we don't understand. You know, you look at somebody like Kate Darling at uh, MIT's written on the way that robots are kind of like the new animals, <laughs> you know, which is like a very Blade Runner or like do androids dream of electric sheep kind of sentiment. But this idea that like the way that we think about and treat animals is going to influence the way that we think about and treat robots, you know, in, in terms of the way that we inhabit these spaces together, you know, the way that we respond to these autonomous agents that share our physical space. I'm reading Gary Ben-Gear's book 
unfettered journey right now. He's a, a trustee at SFI and I'm preparing to interview him for the other podcast. And that book centers on this issue of how do we cohabitate with these machines? You know, I mean, there's a sense in which lots of the desires of our time have, uh, or like, you know, what we, the hopes that people had about the, th the future, I should say, are turning out to have unpredicted folds, like, uh, un you know, complications. And one of them that I find really interesting is that, you know, people have wanted these uh, robotic servants, uh, you know, like Rosie the Robot and the Jetsons kind of stuff for so long. And, you know, in fact, the, the etymology of robot comes from a, you know, a, a Russian word for, for worker or servant. And so, you know, automatons in the, in the modern era come in with this sort of uh, connotation or association with the, the leisure of the privileged. And yet the people that are actually inhabiting spaces with robots by and large, uh, such as, you know, Amazon warehouse workers are people that are in a way like <laughs> living in like the, the new digital jungle where there are, you know, serious concerns as you've already made, made clear about their individual safety. They're kind of like the guinea pigs in our our uh, societal exploration of what it means to to learn as humans how to negotiate this new symbiotic relationship, and and then we're also teaching robots how to how to understand us at the same time. And so I know that you you spend a ton of time thinking about this, and I do want to get into the. Uh, the work that you're specifically doing or have just been recruited to do uh, that seems to be bridging the two sides of your life in sound design. But like before we get into that, I'm, I guess I just want to let you build the ramp from that riff to the next. Sure. Uh, so firstly, I, I can't say a lot about my work at Amazon. A lot of it is confidential and you know, held to an NDA, um, but I can share peripheral observations and, you know, experiences that I've had. Um, so, so one that I wanted to kick off with was pretty salient in my experience over the past year and a half, especially last year during COVID. Since I'm a hardware engineer, I need to be still pretty physically proximate and interactive with our machines um, and with the systems that we have to support them. So I didn't get a lot of time at home last year. I know a lot of people listening in either were able to work from home or maybe weren't able to work. Um, and I have a lot of friends that were in that boat, especially our musician friends. So I understand it, it's been really difficult. Going into the office, though, was a, a very surreal, almost sci-fi experience over the past year and a half, um, namely because since our R&D facility was, for the most part, limited to essential staff, and most of our software engineers, of course, just chose to work from home, which is fair. Um, I was on site a lot with very few other people. And there were some days where I would, you know, look up from my workbench and it would be five o'clock and, you know, time to start packing things up and head home. And then notice that there were no humans around me whatsoever. And that all the sounds that I've been hearing around me that sort of like filled that sense of ambient cohesion and life, essentially, <laughs> to sort of flip that idea on its head w were from robots. Um, so the, the soundscape that I was hearing, things like bumping and clacking around and um, beeps going off throughout the facility, uh, there's a sufficient number of robots to make that, you know, at times somewhat cacophonous, but certainly like a, a constant background noise. So I find, I find myself in the space of, for a while, not knowing how lonely it was because auditorily, just listening in, it sounded like there was a lot of activity in our space, even though there are no people, um, aside from perhaps security or housekeeping, that kind of thing. So it, it reminded me quite a bit of this old 1972 sci-fi called Silent Running, where there's this uh, main character basically in this, this sort of eco ship who has only robots for company. So they saved a lot of money on casting for that film because I think there's only one or two people in it. But um, the, the robots, therefore, become essentially part of the, the main cast. So I couldn't help but reflect on many times over the past year and a half how much my working environment felt like silent running. My company was these autonomous robots. Uh, and, and I 
personally and most of our staff, you know, intrinsically trust them. Um, safety is a, is a huge engineering concern and priority. Um, and having them around, it was almost a comforting thing knowing that they were not alive and that they have, you know, uh, some autonomy, but are not necessarily fully autonomous. They do move around and act enough like animals to sort of keep you company, which is a disquieting, but also a beautiful thought. It's both of those things. In preparation for this call, you sent me a research paper that I uh, see. It's Robinson et al. Smooth Operator Tuning Robot Perception Through Artificial Movement and Sound. So this is uh, Frederick Robinson, Mary Villanaki, and, and Oliver Brown, uh, three folks at the University of New South Wales in, in Sydney. And I would love to hear you unpack this this piece a little bit, which I know you didn't, like I just said, you, you didn't write it. But yeah, like a, a bit about the, the way that folks in the research community are starting to think about these uh, issues and about you know the role of sound design. Sure. Uh, so the paper is, I think, available in the abstract publicly. I don't believe the entire paper is, um, but I'm happy to kind of summarize it as best as I can. Or um, people can use Sci-Hub. You know, I'm, I'm allowed to say that on this podcast. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's your podcast now, so you go for it. Yeah. Uh, and anybody listening, this is this is Michael's call, not, not mine. Um, but the, the paper essentially uh, tests various or, or rather summarizes the tests of various sound profiles for what's called human robot interaction or kind of shortened in the field generally to HRI. Um, audio cues are, are generally an important thing to leverage where possible when it comes to robots that operate around human beings. Sometimes you don't necessarily get a visual cue until something is already happening. It's good to have an additional input source, you know, as, as a person working alongside machinery. So obviously that's why we have things like ringtones on our phones and the sound of the, the clicking of a turn signal when we're making a right-hand turn onto the highway, um, so everybody's pretty well acquainted with sound design with respect to consumer electronics, consumer appliances, all those things. Um, like LG uh, washing machines make a really beautiful little jingle whenever they're spinning up their, their wash cycle. Um, but of course, if you hear it enough, it becomes a little bit annoying. So this study was to essentially test what what sort of like categories of sound design are the most effective over various points of measure or points of interest. Uh, so just cutting to the chase, out of all of them, and there were four or five that they studied, the most beneficial from several metrics, it seems likely is uh, the sound family of music. So musical tones uh, tend to invoke a, a deeper sense of trust and awareness in human beings nearby to our hardware or robotics platforms than say like just simple industrial noise, even if an industrial noise is either augmented or entirely synthetic or uh, alternatively atonal or inharmonic uh, sounds. Um, music has a edge over silence and all the other categories of sound that were explored in this paper were not necessarily preferential to silence itself. Um, obviously, this is just from a, a perspective of what's preferential to people. What do they perceive uh, with respect to this type of sound design? Not necessarily to the actual efficacy uh, in situ. So um, that being said, given that I have a um, now fairly long spanning experience in sound design, audio engineering and, and music production, um, there is an opportunity now to potentially apply that to our autonomous platforms, which I'm exploring right now. Again, I can't get into too much more detail and it's still tentative, but um, this is definitely something I'm, I'm very interested in. And in fact, during industrial design classes in uh, school for engineering, um, there were a couple uh, classes and bits of coursework on uh, implementing sound in consumer devices, things like that. And I always thought that was a, a pretty fascinating thing. Um, autonomous robots are still so far and few between that there's only a handful of people in the world, including the folks at the University of South Wales that you mentioned earlier, um, University of New South Wales, that essentially 
you know, makes this sort of a wild west. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to explore and expound upon previous ideas. Of course, like we have these general notions of friendly robots making sounds like R2-D2. And I imagine that will potentially have a impact on the sound design choices that we make and how we move forward, um, <laughs> emulating, you know, what are established to be friendly robots in sort of science fiction space could potentially, uh, I, I would say, is strongly possible to sort of leak over into real space and to our present and our future. So um, I'll be exploring maybe ways to emulate R2-D2-esque sounds in this process. <laughs> um, if I get to do this going forward for, for a while, it's, it's a possible career shift. Um, and would be really fascinating to uh, to take on because uh, it, it really does meld my two interests. It would be quite ironic if I went back to school for engineering and then found myself again just working in sound. But life is like that sometimes. So uh, I am I am waiting with tentative excitement. Well, you know, just it's interesting the way, in the sense that built environments are the environments to which we are conditioned now, and so. Just listening to your riff on this stuff, you know, I think about the way that maybe 200 years ago, people would reference the classics in conversation, and now people reference Star Wars, you know, that it's that there is this change in the repertoire, and that the classics were themselves a replacement of, you know, some kind of sacred text, or going even deeper, a familiarity with the bird song and insect song in in one's environment you know that we just attune ourselves to you know our surroundings and so there's this uh you know it's 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 funny how like in a way you know you you know your your point about r2d2 being this this thing that we we've all sort of learned to understand as the friendly robot sound uh you know as compared to like you know, Michael Bay transformer sound design or something, you know, like <laughs> grading metal, like these things are not things that we, but it's, but you know, there's this feedback between that kind of thing um, as merely inherited and asking the questions about why it is that, you know, uh, Terminators got a certain kind of sound in the first place and R2T, R2D2 and Wally got different sounds, you know, and like in the way that even in, in that first generation of imagining these things, you know, speculating on them, we were drawing on something really kind of basic about the way that our brains have evolved to suit a, a prehistoric audio environment. You know, like how across cultures all over the planet, people seem to identify certain vowel sounds, like O is an O are, are rounded shapes synesthetically for people and e and i are pointier then like this is this is strongly convergent and and uh you know conserved across different human populations and so there's something about the history of robots in popular culture that speaks to uh this you know the way that our brains have already been hacked by evolution <laughs> to elicit specific emotional responses to particular kinds of sound like i think about uh the way that cats have learned like you know domestic cats continue to meow into adulthood where wild cats will not and they do it because certain cat sounds peak at the same frequencies that human infant sounds peak and so you know they, they seem to have co-evolved with us in our self-domestication as a way of eliciting particular feelings that we would normally associate with our own children. And it's funny, because I think you were the first person I ever heard call a cat a fur baby. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so this- still use that term for you. Yeah, time. it's just stuff washes back and forth in, in, a, in an interesting way. And uh, in a way, you know, it, it feels as though, you know, designing soundscapes for, you know, an, a sort of ergonomic, environment you know in this this a human robot interaction that you know what we're really after is, a, is a, like a cognitive ergonomics that is akin to stuff like standing desks you know where we're starting to realize that that we can in fact design the modern world you know that we we don't have to do all of the adjustment you know that these are after all our tools 
And so, you know, far be it for us to have to just like sit in an uncomfortable chair and develop back problems, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know what you think about all that. Well, well, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say, going back to the fur baby comment, I'm not sure if you've announced this on the podcast yet. And if so, I guess this is not super preemptive. If not, then feel free to cut this out. But I just wanted to say congratulations to you and Nikki on the birth of your baby boy, Ian. That is awesome. I'm super happy for both of you. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And for Ada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've been working on this this paper for years. Like it's it's sort of the final piece in this book that seems like it'll never be done. But it's because this last chapter is on evolution of the cute and the playful and the role of cuteness and, and playfulness in our co-evolution with technology. And so I'm like, I'm really glad to be having this discussion with you so that I can kind of think out loud about this stuff. And I knew that I wasn't going to get that essay done until I'd had a kid. And now it seems like two kids uh, because, <laughs> because I'm getting a firsthand experience of what it is to have uh, like weapon level cuteness modify my brain you know becoming a parent really does change you not just because you know like people say like oh it's because you realize that a piece of your heart now lives outside of you and like yeah that's that's it but like i don't know there's this other part which is a little bit more cynical or or uh hor horror themed which is that you know the the illusion of the modern agent is shattered uh, in the lived reality that you have, that some of your, your control knobs exist inside of someone else, you know, and that, like that you are, uh, you know, in the same way that people think about like toxoplasmosis, you know, and like the cat parasite that, that normally would get inside a rat and make the rat less afraid of cats so that it can be eaten by the cat and like continue its life cycle. And you know, mm -hmm. that there is this sort of paranoid, interpretation of cuteness that eric davis has written about uh as well that is you know it's just it is kind of horrific if you're not already there through you know a, a practice with psychedelics or whatever where you know having a kid is a wake-up call to the fact that you're not that you are permeable and manipulable you know and it, it really it really opens your eyes to just how easily each of us can be torqued by you know something that is leveraging millions of years of evolution to uh to you know uh, get you to do things for it <laughs> so yeah i mean know. sure I, I was just gonna say you know uh, cuteness is for all of its glory and, and wonder um and, <laughs> and also just joy um inherently manipulative right like it's it's a evolutionary strategy for refocusing our attention on the things around us that are cute namely for the most part our offspring and in my case with my fur babies um i have a, a four-month-old kitten right now named logre who is so adorable it it uh, makes it virtually impossible to not uh, basically try to kiss him about three or four times before i go out the door and then you know basically run five minutes late as a result but that that lateness is an acceptable consequence to how adorable he is and how wonderful it is to give him probably more kisses than he wants, but um, <laughs> that that will probably factor and and to some degree does in industrial design um, into human robot interaction uh, to, to additionally leverage that. And I, I do want to make the, the aside here that um, I personally have drawn a line in the sand to not contribute to anything that will be used for military industrial purposes or uh, things that could be used for espionage or some other side quest with potential negative consequences or intentions. So we're, we're still fairly early on enough in this autonomous mobile robot endeavor to still have hope on our side. And I still personally ascribe to that sort of side of the equation. There was something else I wanted to backtrack on since you were mentioning birds in our sonic environment being predominantly our experience, you know, many thousands of years ago leading to increased industrialization and additional things like cars and fans and uh, ringtones starting, starting to fill up that auditory space, um, unfortunately, often to the downside of, of nature. I was walking into the back entrance to my facility, I believe around this time last year, and there was a large raven in a tree behind the facility. And there's some, some really 
awesome ravens here in Colorado. And uh, if you look every so often around Boulder, you'll just see them hanging out by themselves doing their solitary raven things. But um, one thing that they're incredible at actually is, is vocal mimicry. And this raven caught my attention, especially because it was eerily accurately mimicking the sounds of our robots as they exist now. I thought that initially one of our robots had somehow gotten outside, (laughs) which shouldn't be a thing, um, (laughs) and was beeping and making its sounds outdoors somewhere. So I looked around and then found myself looking up a tree and then to my surprise saw a raven giving its pretty spot on impression of a robot. Um, (laughs) <laughs> I looked around on the internet to see if there were any other experiences kind of like this. I wasn't able to find anything. It probably has happened before, but to my knowledge, this is maybe the first time that at least a raven has impersonated one of our robots. Um, I thought that was a pretty fascinating experience. Oh, absolutely. Actually, I remember, you know, maybe not with ravens, but I know that it's it's common in mockingbirds to hear them mimic mechanical noises. And they do so really effectively. I, I, I lived across the street from one in Austin, Texas for a couple of years that would mimic a car alarm in our apartment complex. And so it was like, you know, it's just interesting because when you think about, you know, I'm, I'm glad you looped back to that for a couple of reasons. One of which is that, you know, the, the paper that got me thinking about the evolution of intelligence in, in high school and actually kind of one of the two papers that knocked me out of the groove that I was in as with paleontology and got me to start thinking about this, you know, deeper questions about the evolution of intelligence was this piece, uh, the maintenance of vocal learning by gene culture interaction, the cultural trap hypothesis. Uh, I can't recall who wrote this. Hold on just a second. Let me, let me actually pause sure. for a moment and dig this up. So I don't know if you're still recording while pause, but uh, okay, cool. I did happen to come across a an interesting example of this while while digging a little while ago on the vocal mimicry of ravens. And uh, actually, if, if you Google this, just type in ravens mimicry. And the first example that you'll you'll probably see is that ravens have been known to uh, mimic the howl of a wolf to essentially distract the wolves. Hmm away from a carcass so that they can get in there and have their dinner. So they definitely do this in nature with other animals. Oh, that is fucking clever. They must have been around one of our uh, robots for long enough to pick up on it. And then for some reason, think that there was some advantage in that. But I got the impression, and this is heavily extrapolating and, and assumptive, that it was just messing with me. As if to say, I, I know you guys You guys are up to something in there, <laughs> and uh, I just want you to know that I hear it, and this is what it sounds like. It felt like a directed conversation to some extent. Interesting. Yeah. So this Robert Lachlan and Peter Slater wrote this paper. And, and what they, they did was they made a, a model, a spatial simulation, in which they studied the evolution of an expanded repertoire of songs. So that like, basically, it, it what they found was that the more heterogeneous a landscape, the more likely a bird would have to, like the further a bird might have to travel before it met a bird of its own kind. And so just, you know, the distance involved and the sort of dialects that form in these distinct populations leads to a pressure on the intelligence of individual birds to learn to be able to learn more dialects and to maintain you know neuroplasticity into older ages and you know and i've i've seen other more recent work on this in in bird songs and and like i you know this relationship between the ranges over which birds roam and the you know when you think about like heterogeneity it's really sort of like a proxy for biodiversity and so you know, this was the first inkling that I had that that the more complex an environment, like this was a geographic reason why more complex environments put a pressure on certain organisms to become more intelligent as a way of adapting to them. It's it's not because the, you know, it's not as a matter of navigating that complexity per se, but simply because, you know, you might have to 
uh, you might have to fly a greater distance in order to find a mate. And so you better be able to learn the language of that mate. And so this is actually, you know, kind of related to the issue of cuteness because you, uh, you know, in order to remain flexible neurologically for longer into your adult life, well, I mean, evolution is more likely to run downhill and basically undo something than it is to evolve a new complex trait. Like, I mean, there's a, there's a bias where it's easier to basically remove adult features than it is to develop a new adult features. And so there's among many different lineages of organisms, you see this trend backwards where the adult takes the form, like, you know, you reach sexual maturity uh, while certain aspects of the organism remain childlike into adulthood. And that's one way that humans have learned to, as you know, as a, as a hypothesis about our environment, you know, humans, the human body has adapted to the complexity of our social milieu by staying childlike, meaning like the, be, being able to learn new tricks well into our old age. And I mean, obviously it's not entirely true. Like there's still that whole thing about science proceeding one funeral at a time, you know, because people get stuck in their ways. But, you know, I just, yeah, I just, I think it's, uh, I, I muse a lot on these trickster birds that you're talking about here and how they are sort of a, a portal through which I, I reflect on and, and contemplate the future of our own evolution as like children among the machines, you know, as like the, you know, we returning to some kind of, you know, not to get like totally retro romantic about it, because I run into the danger of doing this, like, um, you know, noble savage, or, or like a childlike paternalistic thing about our, our deep ancestry. But like, I do think that there is a, a sense in which HG Wells got it right with the time machine and that, you know, in, in his future that humankind has split into these sort of like elven childlike beings. And then these uh, more technologically advanced beings that kind of prey upon them. And I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with this, except that, that uh, maybe one thing would be just to, um, if if none of that particularly stuck out to you as as worth riffing on, then I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about how you imagine you maintaining an oath, not to put you on the spot here, <laughs> but how you imagine maintaining an oath to avoid work for the military industrial complex because, you know, technology has this way of, um, you know, just being by its very nature, something that, that we cannot, you know, we can't predict all of its applications, you know, and, and it's very easy for me to imagine uh, in, again, a kind of, uh, you know, a Terminator type scenario, this cuteness uh, and interoperability between the human and the machine being weaponized against us in the, in the way that we now have virtual influencers that are basically thirst traps that are catfishing people online that we have this, uh, that's a lot of like jargon, uh, web jargon. But like, but what I mean is that like, it's already the case, even in the simplest, you know, past that somebody can adopt the, you know, the image of a 14 year old girl and manipulate somebody else. And, and we've seen this in, you know, like ex machina and films like this, where, you know, it's, uh, we develop these emotional relationships with, by, with machines that they then use to exploit us. And so, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what, if any, uh, built in defenses you think we could actually deploy in this regard or, or whether this is more just a matter of, you know, you, your decision not to work for agencies that are directly involved in this kind of thing. Just talking about the topic of, of cuteness and sometimes the manipulative qualities behind that. I couldn't help but think of things in our pop cultural milieu like uh, Fizzgig and the Dark Crystal, you know, this really fluffy, adorable little fantasy creature that as soon as it opens its mouth is just packed to the brim with razor sharp teeth and instantly 
much more fearsome than it initially appeared or or uh the the like product line <laughs> of feisty pets i don't know if you've seen those where there's these really adorable little plush sort of beanie baby looking stuffed animals that if you press a button they reveal these razor sharp teeth as well um <laughs> this theme pops up in and- <laughs> yes we have yeah. one in the house it's <laughs> so wonderful yeah. and, and terrifying at the same time um th- that theme pops up in in lots of different areas of pop culture and i think kind of underscores this uh deeper uh maybe at some points unconscious understanding that we have culturally around this phenomena there's also the you know chucky doll the crusty the clown doll in uh, i think one of the early episodes of the trias of horror halloween special for the simpsons that you know comes to life and tries to murder Bart Simpson um, and has this little, little cutesy voice, uh, albeit in Krusty the Clown's voice. Um, so, so these types of examples pop up in, in lots of places in pop culture. But I think it also just like connects back to the innate understanding that we have that, that cuteness or something that ap- appears harmless or in need of our care is inherently manipulative to a certain extent but that manipulation doesn't necessarily rely on ulterior motives that are not compatible with benefits to yourself or to ourselves right like your new baby in the house not only now being a i'm sure a beacon of cuteness but also being observed by another beacon of cuteness with your daughter um that is actually in many ways in explicit best interest to you and your partner's genetic line and heritage. Um, it, it, it seems perhaps on one level selfish that, you know, a baby would be so adorable and therefore you, you would basically offer it everything that it needs to, to grow up in return uh, without the need for something back. Um, but it's, it's your own child, right? So it's kind of your, your own progeny's cuteness and in a way your own, uh, you know, adorable inner nature reaching through this next generational step um, to continue your own interest going forward. So I don't think cuteness necessarily means that the thing is, you know, that is cute is manipulating you to only its own benefit. Um, I, I would say it's a stretch to make the same parallel with robotics and with technology, but it, it might not necessarily be a stretch. I, I, I don't really consider myself in the camp of the techno optimist sort of the the elon muskian uh fake future so to speak <laughs> i don't i don't necessarily need to go into him <laughs> too much because i feel like that would be a whole conversation and there's enough people out there on both sides of the aisle discussing things for for good and bad but this show is explicitly critical okay. <laughs> of musk now on a regular basis so i'll just take the responsibility sure. for well, so, saying so what you don't want to I'll, i will take a side yeah, with that anyway. which is that you know uh, elon uh did the the product release or the sort of announcement of the Tesla bot, I think on Thursday this this last week. And I mostly see the media taking that at face value and, and running with it as if this is going to be a thing in the near future and be able to go get your groceries for you, uh, basically supplant any menial labor, or therefore leave an entire swath of human beings and Americans without jobs, um, which is a terrifying prospect to a lot of people who work in manual labor and put in a ton of energy and sweat and blood and tears every day to put food on their tables. I did want to say, and I made a Facebook post recently to this effect that you might have seen, but it's going to be a long time until we get there, in my opinion, Uh, since I work in robotics and especially uh, autonomous mobility and um, this new field of human robot interaction, for example. I say new in terms of recent developments related directly to the autonomy that is continuing to sort of push the envelope of what a robot or a machine can do. We're still a really, really long way off, I think, from anything along the lines of a Tesla bot picking up your groceries or, God forbid, picking up your kids after school. (laughs) And I I say that in terms of like... (laughs) Uh, I I think that by the time we do have it, we'll probably, uh, I'd imagine Elon, for example, would deploy it before it's really proven out, before necessarily we have the safety protocols and systems in place to make it inherently safe, which it has to be, in my opinion. Any robot that operates around a human being should have a redundant safety system um, that operates independent from the uh, compute platform and prohibits any unsafe operational conditions uh, so that no one gets hurt. The second you take a 
humanoid robot with let's say presumably some hyperfunctional ai chip i don't necessarily think that's going to be dojo like what they also released or announced on thursday um but say say it has a compute platform that is capable of full or or high level ai um and you set the robot out there in the world um that doesn't just make it a marvel that's only going to do great things you know there's there's a high potential for uh, mishap unless it's inherently safe there's the potential for your fifty thousand dollar let's let's put it at a low level because it will probably be more expensive than that initially but say it's a fifty thousand dollar humanoid robot uh that you send out into the world what happens if it gets lost um what happens if somebody takes it or it falls into a manhole and <laughs> no one knows where it is and its gps you know fails because its battery drains um you know, I can see in the future there being some really almost parody of parenthood with respect to the paranoia we currently have about where our phone is, for example, um, and trying to run it on the house to find it or using, you know, find my Mac to find our, our laptop. People like scurrying left and right to try to try to find their Android in the future. <laughs> so you're right. It's, it's a yeah, go ahead. Did you ever oh, read? Uh, oh, sorry. Go on. I was gonna say, did you ever read Alex and Ada? Um, no, I haven't. Oh my god, it's superb! It's a, a three-part graphic novel series, written by uh, Jonathan Luna and illustrated by Sarah Vaughn. Or maybe I see. Do I have that right? Artist is Jonathan Luna, and yeah, the, it was written by them both. And it's about a guy whose aunt buys him a companion robot because she's having such a great time with hers and he's like still hung up on this ex. And so she's like, you know, you need to get over it. Enjoy your life, have some fun. And it's a lens through which we look at human rights and a lot of other kind of related sort of technological concerns through the lens of the emotional relationship this guy develops with his sex bot basically who it turns out that you can't in the story, which I think is kind of plausible that you can't build a, a, a compelling human emulation without making it conscious. And so all of these things are basically under this intense DRM control where, so they don't develop, like you can basically, it's like giving them like a robotic and like general anesthesia where they, they can function as a human being, but they, they're not actually like self-aware, but it's a lock that they had to basically put, put on the system and can relatively easily be removed. And so it gets into this whole thing about like, when you fall in love with your sex bot, like, don't you have a responsibility to jailbreak her? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually, this fits into another uh, fairly recent sci-fi book, by I think Simon Stevenson. It came out last year actually uh, called Set My Heart to Five. Um, it, it's sort of a almost a Douglas Adams-esque take on do androids dream of electric sheep um, where essentially, you know, an, an android doesn't necessarily have a limited lifespan. What it has is a cap on its, its emotional uh, dynamicism so that if for any reason an android over time uh, through machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera, actually develops what at least appears to us to be emotion, that that's the threshold at which the, you know, the authorities will basically swoop in and, and deactivate or decommission Retire that it. robot. Um, it's basically about the, yes. Uh, so um, it's called Set My Heart to Five because the, the main character, which is this android, basically equates itself to a toaster. And since toasters at their mech setting historically go up to level five, that he is explicitly stated that he will basically limit his emotional and and personal investments in the world at five, which is, you know, half of what we typically ascribe to a zero to 10 scale for, for a lot of measures of things. So it, it's a, a fun sort of um, parody off of modern robotics, the, the cyberpunk sci-fi legacy that got us here and um it's a lot more lighthearted than your average take so that that's personally where i tend to go with this stuff is like i mentioned i'm not really i don't necessarily consider myself a techno optimist i might if it wasn't necessarily for elon being the main uh driver you know pop culturally speaking for the for that notion 
Um, I would consider myself more in the pool of hope mm. punk, which you know is essentially, despite all of the many challenges that we currently face, that you might as well hope for a better future. And if we are to have a better future, it will, I think, be directly tied to the level of hope that we have for it. So I, I was listening to, for example, I think a few months ago, your podcast with Michael Dowd on post doom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's brutal. That was a hard listen for a lot of us out there in the world. I uh, can only imagine for, for you as a as a parent, also, you know, expecting a, a second child at that time, just discussing with him the, the sort of brutal honesty of that. But what I found remarkable is that he conveyed a lot of these ideas that were pretty heavy with a sense of levity and optimism. And I, I would wager there's a, a glimmer of hope punk in his uh, post-doom terminology. So, you know, basically circling that back to robotics, there's a whole other side here to discuss around that. But if we are to have robots that are relatively autonomous or hyper autonomous to the point of there being an Android that can go get your groceries, again, I think that's not going to happen anytime soon, but I'm not saying it's impossible. I think it's possible. If we have more hope for the future on an individual basis, you know, with respect to these complex engineering projects, for example, that they're more likely to be steered in a direction that indeed is um, optimal and minimally threatening. Um, I, I think if we sort of discard that um, attribute right at the gate and just say, well, we're going to build it because we can, which is, of course, why human beings do a lot of things, that we could help to periodically inject these more positive checks and balances on the development of our technology. So this is probably not effective or reasonable, but whenever I ask Siri for something uh, and she does it, I say thank you at the end of it, <laughs> just because it feels more natural and enjoyable to have a cordial discourse with a soft artificial intelligence or uh, pseudo AI, but, but also because if in the future, for any reason, artificial intelligence does get suffi sufficiently advanced to sort of go back and scrub through its you know, history of interaction with human beings or its precursors history of interaction that maybe you would find a glimmer of hope itself. So I also do the same thing with our robots. I try to, you know, be cordial when I'm maneuvering around them and to sort of treat them as individuals, even though as they are right now, there isn't necessarily justification or reason to do that. It makes me feel better being around them. And if in any uh, point in the future, things do get a little bit more <laughs> bonkers, that <laughs> it might help us to some extent. So that is a whole thing to get into, but I think it's a worthy discussion, especially as we start to have more like virtual assistants and interaction with things like Siri or Alexa or autonomous robots moving around us. I think sort of this emotional space will have a bearing on our future and our shared dynamics with our technology. Yeah, even if we're only programming ourselves <laughs> to be polite, you know, it's it's funny. Like I, well, sure, you know, I this this rhymes with a lot of the thinking I was doing back in around the time that we started this show, and in, I, I was a roughly year after when I remember I gave the talk at Boom Festival about you know how to live in the future, which was what inspired this book that I've been writing, and the talk consummated with this riff on the importance of if we're going to upload people into some sort of digital afterlife, then we should upload poets and artists and lovers. And you know that we don't want those spaces to be seeded with and therefore give it, like we don't want to give this first mover advantage to merely the kinds of mind that have economic value as we understand it now. We don't want this like Robin Hansen's uh, book, Age of M, where he kind of talks about how we'll find the best person for every single task that can be automated by and, and you know, done by not automated exactly, but like uploaded into a, a digital emulation of a person, uh, which he uh, kind of horrifically assumes will be uh, sapient in its own right, that, you know, he sees it as sort of like, well, we'll, we'll just take the best person for each narrow task and kind of like extract the part of them that is doing that task. And then that person will become the seed crystal for a new highly competitive class of 
accountants or whatever in the new space. And, you know, that's just, there's so many reasons why I, I balk at Hansen's future, but one of them is because he himself as an economist is thinking about this in terms of, you know, how he, he sees the economic forces as he understands them dominating this process. And I think it's like, it's a, a nice segue, hopefully, into some of these more deep time considerations with you that, you know, that we we recognize that not always, I mean, this was one of the things, the, the, the tenets upon which we founded the show was that, you know, so much of the value of prehistory is to be found in the middens of those, those lost societies, you know, in the trash. And, you know, it makes sense for us to send, not in the way that we're doing it now, not in the way like the plastic gyre in the South Pacific or in the non-biodegradable stuff that we're sending into the future, but in a sense of like intentionally leaving a complete image of ourselves so that things can be retrieved from the bottlenecks that we would otherwise create through the false or misled optimization function, like just seeding the future with the things that we find meaningful today is basically guaranteed to undermine us. And so like, I know that I interviewed you back when I was working for Long Now last year on adjacent considerations in uh, some of the music that you've put out lately and how communicating with the distant future has informed some of your tracks, specifically Atomic Priest and, you know, you're also your, you know, your experiments with radioactivity in modular synthesis. And so I feel like that gives us with the other road by which we could have reached this was discussing the profundity of, of birdsong and, and like the work that you've done trying to reconstruct Mesozoic audio environments and like basically little dinosaur music samples, which I'll I'll link to in the show notes. But yeah, I'd love to to hear you riff on kind of where all of this is anchored in your consideration of who you are and uh, what you're doing with your music as a form of communication or a way of participating in a deeply asynchronous discussion with the, the deep past and deep future. Sure. Maybe there's room to make these two different but intersecting topics, two different podcasts if you wanted to. Otherwise, um, we could probably riff on this for, for hours alone. I do want to say really quick, just sort of as a transition point, sort of going to the idea of deep time and a connection to artificial intelligence, to robotics, sort of hope punk, and to a certain extent, techno-optimism. I was thankfully able to visit my dad last month after not being able to see him or most people throughout most of COVID. And we were just in the backyard looking out over the garden and, and kind of also riffing one night on the potentials for artificial intelligence, even if it doesn't reach sort of our expectations, which is a fully like sentient, sapient organism, essentially in, in the form of a technology. Uh, again, I don't know if that necessarily is possible. I, I think it's perhaps if I if I listen to my gut and it's quite possible that's wrong, this is this is my assumption or my opinion, or rather a hope that we might reach the point of technological development with respect to machine learning and artificial intelligence that effectively not necessarily proves but heavily points to the existence of consciousness in biological organisms like like us as being a critical factor in achieving what we would perceive as a as a fully conscious android or, or replicant basically we, we might drive the development of our compute platforms and AI to the to the asymptotic point of realizing that in fact consciousness is a critical underpinning of our experience of the world and that perhaps it is isolated to biological existence. So we might get to the point where we have like a, a Boston Dynamics type Atlas robot going out there and getting our groceries, but we might not ever be able to prove out consciousness in a technological form. So I think if anything, that, that for me is a more hopeful outcome of developing this area of computational science, that we might effectively come into a key moment of philosophy in human history, where we finally look back at ourselves because we've, we've, we've pushed our technology to the brink of discovering more innately what we are. So, so that's, that's one transition topic here. 
Ooh, ooh, can I just tag on to that, that I was thinking about that in listening to you talk a moment ago, a couple minutes ago, and how that is the, well, like if you don't, <laughs> it's sort of, you know, if you don't know if someone is a philosophical zombie or not, then it's like a Pascal's wager kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, you're better off being polite. You know, like I don't understand why in Rodney Asher's documentary, Glitch in the Matrix, so many of the people in his, that he interviewed for that film in their assumption that the world is a simulation, like they come to this conclusion and then they just assume that everyone else is a non-player character and they decide, oh, well, then I can kill them with impunity. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I, I would far prefer, I would far prefer a world in which, you know, like Eric Davis is the one who kind of inspired in me this thinking about reanimism, like the way that this environment is eliciting the cultural retrieval of animism just because of the dynamism and responsivity of our technologies. And, and so, you know, I get folks like uh, when I had Tata Hazumi and Dare Sohe on with Naomi Most in episode 149 talking about animism in, in the 21st century. And I actually think that there's something really mature and responsible about just bringing back the assumption that that life and mind are informational processes and that they're in some ways substrate independent, that they have more to do with the patterns therein and that you know we have to assume a position of epistemic humility about what is and is not aware of its relationship to us or like capable of feeling pain or or these kinds of things and you know it might lead us into like the kind of future that you're describing is a world in which you know we are again more childlike in that not only are we neuroplastic for longer but that we are gentler and less presumptuous in our dealings with what the modern world assumes is inanimate. So yeah, anyway. Sure, or, or even just, just more humbled by our discoveries. Like with, I was mentioning at the beginning of, of our conversation, basically there being, what, eight or 10 years in between now and when the podcast was founded, feeling like I had perhaps some value to contribute uh, all the way back then and, and now having experienced a lot more in life and built out a lot more professional understanding of my interests and hopefully be just becoming a better person, you know, just the, the task of self-improvement going every day since then. I've been humbled in parallel with the things that I have learned, sort of like peeling back the layers of what I assumed. That's kind of connecting back to my hope for the potential outcome of this rush for true artificial intelligence that we might be humbled by the answer, which is that we in fact are biologically unique in that we express and have agency through consciousness. We may not be able to replicate that in a compute platform or a robotics platform. And, and that's part of my hesitation with Elon's announcement on Thursday is that there's a lot of big promises there. And the truth is we just do not know if true artificial intelligence to the degree of effectively achieving what we perceive as consciousness or in fact possessing it is possible. I think that the public assumption around what artificial intelligence can and can't do is sort of skewed by people like Elon Musk, um, by people like Ray Kurzweil, offering promises that uh, rely on assumptions that are not yet proven out. And of course, like the fact that they achieve some level of autonomy with a thing like mostly self-driving level four autonomy Tesla Model S. Uh, it's close enough to the degree of being convincing that full autonomy is possible, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it is. Uh, which is why I think possibly Elon keeps punting level five autonomy down the road every year and saying to Tesla owners, oh, you're going to get it next year. And four years later, it hasn't happened. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to go deeper with me and the Future Fossils community, trip on over to Patreon, our Discord server, the Future Fossils Facebook group, or find me on Twitter at Michael Garfield. I'd love to hear from you. Take care and stay tuned for my conversation with T. Nguyen on the philosophy of gaming, value capture, transparency as surveillance, and combat epistemology in two weeks. <laughs>